Since Half-Life 1, Jeff Keighley has produced several mini-books about Valve, containing exclusive behind-the-scenes information about the company and the games that they've made, and the ones that they haven't. These mini-books are worth checking out. The information in this video has been obtained from Half-Life Alex: Final Hours, which is the latest one he's done. These are not games. They're a series of super-polished interactive storybooks, kind of like PDFs, but with animations, sounds, and full 3D jumping headcrabs and stuff. I feel I need to make what these final hours are as clear as I can, because his Titanfall final hours, despite a glowing recommendation from Jeff Keighley, has gotten a lot of hate, mostly from people who have spent 0.1 hours in it before realising it wasn't the game that they thought it was. Half-Life Alex: The Final Hours doesn't just cover the making of Alex, but also fills the gaps between Half-Life 2 Episode 2 and that game, and it makes for fascinating reading. It even has a fully 3D scan of the Valve offices, so you can see what it would have been like to be there as the magic happened. When Half-Life 2 came out, the Source engine it was based upon was shiny and new. But the same engine was used for Episode 1, then again for Episode 2 in 2007. Even then, Valve knew Source was a dated engine. But in 2008, during development of Episode 3, Valve finally decided that Source was restricting what they could do, and that they needed a new game engine. Instead of building the world out of pre-made LEGO bricks, they wanted to give themselves the ability to design their worlds with the freedom of a paintbrush. That was the goal of Source 2. While many at Valve were busy with Left 4 Dead 1 and 2, it seems that some members took this time to start work on the new Source 2 engine. It seems they chose Left 4 Dead 2's plantation campaign to build Source 2 around and to test it on, and by mid-2010, less than a year after the game's release, they had finished the entire plantation campaign, all re-envisioned in beautiful new Source 2 graphics. Just for comparison, here's Left 4 Dead 2's Source 1 version. This image of Source 2 has been floating about on the internet for ages, but in Alex: The Final Hours, for the first time ever, this flyby has been showcased. Compared with Source 1, the shadows are much more intricate and realistic, and surfaces which would have been flat textures in Source are now fully modelled in 3D. This would have looked incredible in 2010. It still holds up quite well by today's standards, but I noticed that a few of the props would perhaps have been more detailed had they been made for Half-Life Alex. And it is weird to see some of the props and textures that would later be used in stuff like CSGO. Source 2 was to be the engine to power Valve's next batch of games. But just as it was a solution to the problems they had been having, it also proved to be a problem itself, hindering development of many potential Valve games for the following decade. Up till this point, Valve had been churning out a game a year. Episode 2 in 2007, Left 4 Dead in 2008 and 9, Alien Swarm in 2010, and Portal 2 in 2011. I guess you could count CSGO in 2012 and Dota 2 in 2013, but the old style of single-player experiences Valve had been known for effectively stopped after Portal 2. And that's when the dark period for Valve began, which the final hours describes as the wilderness. Valve as a company believed that the best stuff would be created when people worked on what they wanted to work on the most. Everybody was free to do whatever they wanted, and to work with whoever they chose to, in the hope that great ideas would lead to awesome products. But we all know how that turned out. While a lot of stuff got started, project after project failed to be completed. People lost interest, or things changed, or the unfinished state of the Source 2 engine prevented them from progressing further with it. There's a timeline in the final hours, detailing all of the different projects the company seriously worked on before giving up. Let's talk about a few of them. In 2012, Valve started work on an RPG, kind of like Dark Souls, sort of like Monster Hunter, even a bit like Elder Scrolls. The idea was to release a small game, then to gradually ship new bits and features to it over time. But this project never got far. It almost became a single-player Dota experience at one point, but then it ceased to exist. In 2013, they started work on Left 4 Dead 3. It was to be an open world, based in Morocco, and with hundreds of zombies. More recently, we've seen all these images of it, which looks like it could have been from this project. Now, it isn't specifically said in the final hours, but it's implied that you could build your own base as well. But sadly, Left 4 Dead 3 failed because Source 2 wasn't ready to handle such an ambitious project. Pieces of your base would go missing, and zombies would float in. In 2015, when Source 2 was in a better, more finished state, they tried again to make a Left 4 Dead game. To avoid internet hype, they decided to call the project Hot Dog. But this was only worked on for a few months before they started repeating the same old bad development habits and the game was again cancelled. In 2013, they started on another new game that skipped the Source 2 mess by having its own engine. 
and that was a game called Arty. Based in a voxel environment, kind of like Minecraft, this was to be a light-hearted experience similar to Portal where players could create, destroy and manipulate the world to complete tasks. The player helped a character called King Kevin to break out of a prison by tearing down walls, building bridges and shrinking animals and objects. This script for the game hints at the sort of things the player had to do. On the timeline, Artie was worked on for years and years, only stopping in 2017, right when Valve announced another game, Artie Fact. Coincidence? In 2013 they also started on Half-Life 3. Half-Life 3 might not have become Half-Life 3, but the name was used for the project. Inspired by Left 4 Dead's campaigns, the goal was to make a replayable Half-Life experience by making the world change every time you played it. Perhaps similar to Left 4 Dead's director, which placed objects and enemies in the level based on how well you were doing at the time. You'd have the same goals every time, like say to rescue a prisoner from a building, but every time you played it, the building would be different and enemies would be in different locations and so on. These procedurally generated sections would then lead back to more crafted story moments that the Half-Life series is known and loved for. They were serious about this project, they even rescanned the G-Man's face and dabbled with updated character animations. But again, the Source 2 engine wasn't ready to handle such a complicated project. They mentioned the lighting, visibility calculations and save game features weren't up to the task, which I assume would be down to the procedurally generated nature of the environments. So I believe Half-Life 3, much like Left 4 Dead 3, was put on hold until Source 2 was ready to handle it. But something came along before this that changed everything again. On top of all these new projects, as well as creating and maintaining CSGO, Team Fortress 2 and Dota 2, in 2012 Valve started something else as well. It wanted to get into hardware. Sort of like what Steam had done for software, only for hardware. We know the Steam controllers and Steam machines failed, but their VR journey, which at this point appears successful, started back in 2012. Back then the focus was on wearable hardware and augmented reality, but Gabe quickly realised that being able to interact with a virtual world was better than simply being able to peer into it, so they moved their focus over to virtual reality instead. The final hours documents how their controllers and headsets progressed. The headset started as a series of primitive prototypes in QR covered rooms, then in 2016 following a collaboration with HTC came the Vive headset. Valve then had plans for the Vader, which was to be a super advanced headset which, had it ever been released, would have cost about $5,000. They got the best ideas from that and put it into Project Frank, which later became known as the Valve Index, which, although still expensive, managed to get the cost down considerably. I won't be covering the hardware any more than I have here, but the final hours covers its development extensively along with the controllers, audio and other features. The collaboration between Source 2 and Valve's VR intentions became known in 2015 when they showcased Robot Repair. This demo was used by Valve to experiment with how a player would interact with the virtual world and I believe shaped their future products, both hardware and software. Although it started as a standalone demo, Robot Repair ended up becoming just one of the minigames in the lab, which was used by Valve to understand the uses of VR better. The rest of this was done in the Unity engine since Source 2 was still very limited at the time. And get this, in just 8 months Valve actually finished the lab. They said they had tough deadlines for it since it needed to be ready for when the Vive shipped. So it seems like, while creativity and freedom is great for starting projects, Valve still benefited from pressure and deadlines to help them to finish things. As is said in the final hours, they were wrong to assume that people were happiest working on what they wanted to work on. They were in fact happier working on a big thing even if it wasn't exactly what they wanted to work on. And so ended the wilderness as members of Valve slowly but surely began to work together on fewer but bigger projects again. While Half-Life Alex is Valve's first full proper VR game, the company dabbled with a number of smaller Half-Life themed VR experiences first. Apparently they liked choosing Half-Life for the VR projects because it helped the team at Valve to imagine what it could be like. In comparison to all the vague unfinished experimental projects during Valve's wilderness period, Half-Life but in VR proved to be easy to imagine and an easy sell to help get a team together to all work on a larger, combined gaming project. The first Half-Life themed VR project was actually intended to be one of the mini-games for the lab. It was to be a shooting gallery experience, taking place in Half-Life inspired environments using existing Half-Life assets. It was nicknamed Shooter and seemed to be the Half-Life equivalent of Super Hot VR. So while it never came out, it got Valve thinking about other things they could do with VR in Half-Life. 
In 2015, Project Borealis briefly existed as the idea of a Half-Life game set on the bridge of the Borealis ship. Players would explore it as it travelled in time between the Seven Hour War and the bit of time just after Episode 2 was set. There was the idea that players could fish off the bow of the ship as some kind of VR fishing minigame. But the project never gained much momentum inside Valve. It was just a small project featuring Laidlaw, the writer for Half-Life, and he eventually retired from Valve at the end of 2015. The third Half-Life VR prototype was made in just six weeks and was codenamed E1M1. It was a 10 minute long demo, kind of like Half-Life Alex, but using existing Half-Life 2 assets instead. There's a nice long demo of this in action in the final hours. The bits I found interesting were as follows. The movement system is extremely similar to the one eventually seen in Half-Life Alex. The environments are dark and depressing, also similar to most of the ones seen in Half-Life Alex. It's super buggy. Grabbing a crate caused it to explode, and the player took lethal full damage by landing on the crate they were already standing upon. He drops to 1 HP because I assume for playtesting reasons, the player was made to be invincible. While it was only 10 minutes long, in playtesting people would often spend 30 or 40 minutes exploring it, which made Valve realise just how much potential VR environments had, and why Half-Life Alex's gameplay focuses so much on exploration and scavenging. The final hour says that the gloves from CSGO were used in this demo, but chronologically, this prototype came out first, with custom gloves coming to CSGO at the end of 2016. Ridiculously large keys are used to gain access to new bits of the level. The headcrab AI looks to be the same speed as Half-Life 2's. I guess this is where they learned that enemies had to be slower for VR. And you get to see a crowbar in action. I recall Valve saying that they removed stuff like this from Alex because players would get the crowbar stuck on doorways, and also because it's more associated with Gordon Freeman than it is with Alex. I think those are poor excuses to not feature melee combat in VR, so here's hoping for the next VR game that they feature it again. Anyway, this basic prototype got them thinking about a larger Half-Life VR experience. This started out as a 4-5 hour long adventure through Half-Life 2's world, using Half-Life 2's assets that it would only take them about a year to develop. They rushed the pre-production as they wanted to get started on developing the levels as soon as they could, so as to avoid the same unfinished fate as the other projects Valve had been working on. They called this project HLVR. Even some members of Valve initially thought it was a joke, and didn't even know if Gabe was aware of this project. HLVR continued to grow bigger and bigger. It ended up getting its own assets. More and more members of Valve began moving to the project. After years of mess and fragmentation, it was the project that helped unite the company under one project again. It helped get the Source 2 engine finished, and eventually became what we know today as Half-Life Alex. As you might expect from Half-Life Alex: The Final Hours, it talks a lot about this project too, but I'll leave that for another day. From it, I've learned just how bad things got in Valve. It's so sad to hear of all the projects that were cancelled for one reason or another, it makes me imagine a world where we continue to get a game a year from the company. So much lost time. It's made me realise that Half-Life Alex has more significance than to be just another Half-Life game, or the world's first big VR title. It's the project that fixed Valve, and that has laid the Source 2 foundations for whatever they do next. And it kind of mirrors my own thoughts about Half-Life Alex. It's a fun enough title, but I'm even more excited for what they have planned next. I hope this is the start of an exciting new period for the company. I strongly suggest you check out The Final Hours on Steam, it's a fascinating read and I've only covered a tiny fraction of its content in this video. Find a link to it in this video's description.